So I'm going to start because you didn't get the you didn't get the Rose Wolf Awards. I can start. <laughs> if you'd graduated from this university, maybe. So. Frank Iacobucci came to the University of Toronto Law School in 1967 as a professor of company law. And I came to the University of Toronto in 1967 as a student. He taught me company law, thereby making me firmly committed to the practice of family law. Stole my but we were, Stole my we, were, we were so friendly. He came to my wedding 50 years ago. And I remember the present he and Nancy gave me. And then when he retired from the court, you'll get a chance. When he retired <laughs> in 2004, when Frank Iacobucci retired, I, I didn't replace him because he's not replaceable. I inherited his seat and his judicial assistant, who was so bereft at losing Frank Iacobucci as her judge that for about a week she called me Justice Iacobella. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Farrell, for your, your kind introduction. And uh, Rosie, I have nothing to say. Oh, good. Coffee You've is. You've sold three of my best lines. But anyway, I'll do the best I can. But welcome to all of you, my personal welcome, uh, to the uh, Madam Justice Rosalie Abella Fan Club Toronto Chapter. Uh, we are here uh, to honor you. Again, Rosie, for your, for your fantastic successes in so many different fields, uh, a dazzling career, and, and one which has received not only national but international recognition. So I, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here. But you may rightfully ask, what the hell, what am I doing here? Why did I get this role? It's very difficult to answer that. But I have some reasons. One is, first of all, we met over 50 years ago. And I was, there was an immediate affinity because I thought Abella was Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Second, as Rosie has pointed out, she did take my course in company law. And because of the inspiration that it had on her to do family law, you know, we wouldn't be here tonight <laughs> without that course in company law that I gave, <laughs> when you think of it. Because it did launch. I became a judge at 29, which I'll come back to in a minute. I also had the great fortune to attend Rosie's and it Itch's Irving's wedding 50 years ago, as she mentioned the best dessert table I've ever had in my life. <laughs> and finally, my real reason for being the interviewer is because uh, my application to be interviewer, I got the signatures of 121 of Rosie's closest friends. <laughs> and that's why I'm here. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's a great honor for me uh, to be, in fact, looking back at our time together as a faculty member and student and being able to celebrate as one form, as former teachers do to celebrate the successes of their students and this success of this lady is just unbelievable it's very difficult to have questions not because <clears throat> it's difficult to think of questions but it's difficult to choose the one just that should be asked of this uh, wonderful human being. Um, so it's, I'm, I, I will do my best. I'm, it's not going to be legal, uh, but it, it'll have the little bit of law uh, in it. But I want to start at, at the beginning, which was July 1st. Interesting that you're born on our ho it. national holiday. It, it meant it, nothing in Germany. And there was no celebration. No celebration, no fireworks, You don't remember nothing. it. You, I, no, you, that's you don't true, I don't. It but but, but, but I, I want you, you, you jumped over the fact of birth there, but could you share something about the background, uh, particularly about your amazing parents? Because I remember 
something about your father studying in Krakow. And I think that should be shared with, with this wonderful audience. About the background, how you, what the ch challenges that your family faced, and you're coming to Canada, and how Canada was so lucky that you came to Canada. One of the amazing things about growing up and becoming a parent is that you suddenly discover who your own parents were uh, and what you learned from them in ways um, that are so subtle. I have a much more um, in-your-face approach with my children. This is what you do, this is what you don't do. Very annoying. But my parents, I realized, just lived their lives and had conversations and I realized much later who they were and what they had taught me. So we came to Canada in 1950. I learned later that they had a lot of trouble coming into Canada. Irving Abel is none is too many, explained the story. Uh, they uh, both, they got married on September the 3rd, 1939, which is extraordinary. The day World War II officially started. They had a child very soon after. And um, I used to ask them, why did you stay in Poland? Well, they were quite successful and couldn't possibly imagine what was going to happen. So they were rounded up by uh, the Germans in October of 1942, I think, and gave their son into the care of the woman, a woman who had worked at my mother's factory for 40 years with some money, saying, we don't know where we're going to go. I, all of this I learned later. Um, so would you take care of him? And we'll see what happens. When they were there for a couple of days, they thought it, it was a work camp, the first camp they went to. They thought it would be safe. And my mother uh, got a ride with a German soldier back to the place she had left the child. And a woman answered. It was the woman's sister who said her sister panicked, gave the child to my father's family in a little town 30 minutes away. So she went to my father's family's town, found my father's father. They had rounded up the town, the baby, my father's, father, my father's mother, and brothers that afternoon. She came back to the work camp, told my father, and he stopped eating, and ended up in the infirmary where a very nice doctor got him an office job, I liked him, got him an office job. Then they got separated. My mother and my grandmother went one place, he went another place. After the war, uh, my mother found out that he was in Theresienstadt. She was at, liberated first. Rode the rails down to Czechoslovakia, to Prague. They wouldn't allow her into the camp because uh, there was a typhoid epidemic in Theresienstadt. She snuck in with a garbage detail found him at the back of the camp listening to the radio because they were announcing survivors and snuck him out. Um, they went back to Poland, uh, but it was dangerous to be in Poland then, especially if you had property because they were, they had now nationalized the property. Ended up in Germany. He went to, we were first in Berlin, then we went to Stuttgart where I was born. And he went to the Americans and said, I'm a lawyer. He graduated from the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, uh, which was four years of university, two years of articling with the Court of Appeal, two years of uh, working with a law firm. And then the war broke out, so he never got to practice. But he went to the Americans and s taught himself English and said, can I work here? Is there a job for a lawyer? So they gave him a job. Um, representing displaced persons in southwest Germany. He was in charge of Stuttgart and Munich. And then when we got to Canada, the first thing he did was go to the Law Society and say, I work for the Americans. I know English. What tests do I have to write to become a lawyer? And they said, you can't because you have to be a citizen. And that takes five years. So he became an insurance agent, uh, happily. When he came home, it's one of my earliest memories in Canada of his coming home and saying, I can't be a lawyer here in Canada. I remember saying, then I'm going to be a lawyer. I had no idea what it meant, but I was four years old, and I could see how disappointed he was. And I just 
I just stayed on that course. I was going to be what he couldn't be. And what was amazing was that he never complained. Uh, neither of my parents or grandmother ever complained. They were strong. They coped. Um, they expected nothing, but they thought you have to work really hard, that this is a country of opportunities, but you have to make them happen. Nobody's going to hand you anything. And when I, when I see who they were, what strong, resilient, humane, um, generous, optimistic people they were coming from what they came from, I realized how lucky I was. They, they had no hesitation talking about what had happened. There are some Holocaust homes that are understandably very dark. Um, demons are oppressive. They were very open about the stories, told us everything from uh, my saying, how did you feel when you found out your son was gone, to how do you wash your hair in concentration camp, like everything I wanted to know they talked about without ever crying. So here are the afterthoughts now that I'm older. When we went to the Jagalonian University uh, with uh, um, an, a trip that Erwin Kotler had organized at the university, I found some papers, and one of them was a letter from the judge in Radom, where he was articling, where he was clerking, that said, this is to inform you that your test for becoming a judge will be in October 1939. I had no idea that he had applied to be a judge because in the European system, you can take the judicial system or the legal. He never told me. So I realized that in so many ways that no one in our family anticipated or expected in 1950 when he came here that life was going full circle and that I was finally getting to do what he wanted to do. Now, there's a legal story. The legal story is this. He couldn't practice law because he wasn't a Canadian citizen. Oh. Most of the things that I've done in my life, I was advised by my close friends who were older not to do them because they were very controversial. And they were right. They were. And one of the most controversial was the Royal Commission on Equality and Employment. And it was, a, it was a royal commission that I would say unified Canada. Because when the report came out, every single newspaper in the country said, this is awful. You cannot make companies or governments hire people they don't want to hire. What about the merit system? Um, but the hardest part of writing that report was the first 18 pages of the 300. And that was trying to figure out what equality means in Canada. And all I had to go on was the American jurisprudence, because no one else had, had developed a theory of equality in their constitutional uh, jurisprudence. And the American jurisprudence was, in the 14th Amendment, equality means treating everyone the same, which made no sense to me at all, because you can't treat a woman who's pregnant the same as a man who's pregnant. You can't, you can't treat somebody in a wheelchair the, some, the, the same way as somebody who's able-bodied. So I, I, that 18 pages took me a month to write. The rest of the report, 280 pages, I did in two months. And I said discrimination is the arbitrary impediment of something that gets in the way of you and your ability. And that's what equality means, making sure that people have their differences respected and accommodated so they can be treated as equal. The first judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada, you might have been on it, were you on it in 1989, the Andrews decision, was a case in which the Supreme Court had to decide what equality means. And they decided for the first time that equality means, and they quoted the report, respecting and acknowledging differences so that people can be accommodated and treated as equals. And what was the case about? It was about a lawyer in British Columbia who couldn't practice law in British Columbia because he wasn't a citizen. So they used my words in that controversial report to strike down the provision that had kept my father out of the practice. And 
he died a month before I finished law school, but that was something I wanted to put on his grave and say, we did it. <laughs> well, I think the answer to my question is a book. Uh, <laughs> And it's a, and a fascinating book. It really is. But you mentioned that there were only five women in your class at law school. It's, and I, I can understand you were inspired by your father, uh, who couldn't practice his profession and, his, and apply his education that he had, had obtained. Uh, but this is also, you, you knew that there weren't that many women who would go to law school. Um, so uh, in, in those days, there weren't that many. Five, there were three in my class, uh, five in yours. So there, there, how, did it, how did that make you feel? That's a very interesting question. I don't think I knew that women, that there weren't very many women in law school. I knew that you know, when you go to bar mitzvahs and weddings when you're a little kid, people say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're kidding if you're a girl because they, they know you're supposed to say, I want to get married and have children. Well, I did, but I'm Jewish, but I also wanted to have a career. So I would say, I want to be a lawyer. And they said, isn't she adorable? She wants to be a lawyer. <laughs> Impossible girls aren't lawyers. But my parents, my mother and father, both said, why not? You want to be a lawyer? Give it a shot. So I went to law school and found out that there were only five women out of 150, but that was okay. That, I have to tell you, um, the law school was extremely generous, and my fellow students were generous, but especially generous were the faculty who, who just kind of nurtured me because law school, those three years were traumatic for me because in the first year, my grandmother died just before my first year exams. My father died just before my third year exams. And the professors at this law school kept me going and just said, you're going to do it. I said, I don't want to even apply for an articling job. I don't think I can make it through my third year. I'm just I'm doing it for him, and it's too hard, too sad. And they got me an articling job. They said, he'll want to see a letter knowing that you're going to carry on. And, and they were right. And I did, and looking back, those, those family genes of you can't let the world get you down, mm. you can't look back, you can't complain, just pick yourself up and go forward, um, that was the test. But this school helped me stay on my feet. Rosie, you, ha you have a mastery of words written and oral it's, it's fueled by a sort of, it seems to me, a curiosity of intellect and, and, a, and a, an engagement with ideas. What, what was, what was in, in your background uh, that, that, and makeup that accounts for that? That's a very good question. I don't know. I can tell you that one of the earliest memories I have of Canada is my mother sending Tony and me to the library every Friday and saying, get three books and then read them that week and go back and get three more books. And books were incredible for me as an immigrant because I discovered universes that you can't know when you're in a, we were at Oakwood and St. Clair in Toronto, like it was a very, there weren't even any Jewish kids there, maybe two or three. So I learned the world through books and I went through that children's section by the time I was 12, I'd read every single book in the children's section. So I went over to the adult section. The, the librarian took me over and said, she wants to join, but she's only 12. And they said, fine, uh, we'll let her join, but we want to watch the book she takes. So I remember going. I had no idea what I was getting. Um, and I found a book by somebody named Jerome Weidman called The Enemy Camp. And the librarian said, uh-uh-uh, not till you're 14. Oh, I thought. That's a book I want to get when I'm 14. <laughs> and the first book I got out when I was 14 and could actually take out anything I wanted was Jerome Weidman's Enemy Camp, and I found the page. I found exactly what she was talking about. <laughs> I couldn't believe that that's what men did to women. But anyway, um, so I, books were 
important in our house. My father and mother were both interested in ideas, especially my father. Um, we talked about everything. And school, you know, the public school system is incredible. The teachers opened our eyes to world events and um, coming home and talking about what we learned at school. Why I was interested, I don't know, but it was childlike. I have no idea. It was not an, a sophisticated understanding of anything. I'm not sure it was until I became a lawyer. But I've always benefited from the ideas other people have had in order to get my own. The bad ones make me think. You know, Isaiah Berlin's There's No Pearl Without Some Irritation in the Oyster made me think, why don't I like this idea? And the good ones I build on. So I don't know. Why do you like ideas? Well, it, it, it makes life interesting, doesn't it? It makes your life a lot more interesting when you think of ideas. And your imagination is huge, which is, I think comes from your thirst for ideas and exercising your brain. It's just fantastic to see. It also helps if you don't have um, a solid commitment to the status quo. If you think the status quo is just the beginning of the conversation, then it opens your mind to all kinds of possibilities. So the, the, the is is different from the should be. So it's always been part of how I think about life and law as should be, not just is. Is is lucky. Should be is responsibility. Well, that's going to get into another question. Can you hear me? That I'd like to ask a little later, because uh, the, there's a debate that goes on about law. Is it more about the is? There was an article in today's paper in the Globe about that. The is doctrine as opposed to should be, which is something different from just doctrine. So maybe you, you, want, you can comment on that now if you want. Did you read the article in the Globe today? So this is an article about a debate that is currently not, not currently, that's been very live in the United States for many years, um, and newly emerged in Canada, I would say, as a phenomenon. So the, the one thing about being older is you see ebbs and flows. When I went to law school, 67 to 70, we were all wild about what the Americans were doing, the American Supreme Court because it was Earl Warren, it was Brennan, it was Blackman, it was, it was a, a court that was muscular in its protection of rights. And Canada, you know, we had the BNA Act and it was a muscular protection of who's got the right to have the egg marketing board, the province or the federal government. So constitutional law wasn't exactly um, the, the lodestar that you went to law school with. But then we got a Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982, immediately after the decade of the 70s and the 60s, where we started debating everything. Um, our institutions, our families, our, um, what, what Canada should be, were we different from the United States? All of that was happening. And then the Charter came after those debates. And we serendipitously had what I would call the right people on the Supreme Court of Canada. You had Brian Dixon, you had Bertha Wilson, you had eventually Frank Iacobucci, Claire Legault de Bay, Jerry LaFerre. You had the right people who took the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and said, we accept this responsibility that the government's given us. Because judges don't put signs up saying, you know, we'd love a charter, Can we have a charter. So the government, Parliament assigned to the courts responsibility for deciding whether what they did was constitutionally compliant. Now, at the time it first started in the 80s, when Dixon and Wilson were the Fred and Ginger of the Charter choreographing these new rights and everybody loved it, people said, yes, that's what we want from our Supreme Court. Somebody that, a court, an institution that invigorates the words on the page. What does equality mean? What does association mean? What does 
uh, freedom of religion mean? Um, and then in the 90s, we started to get the air pollution from the United States, which was, you know, political activism, uh, politicization, uh, judges trespassing on legislative authority, and that was uh, not even the Reagan era, it was the Bush era, it was Orrin Hatch, it was Tom DeLay, and it started to affect Canada. And people started to say, hmm, is this really what judges should do? That was the 90s, and it was because uh, the composition of the court changed, it became very rigorously protective of accused rights, as it should be, and the public isn't wild about, that can be red meat to the public, letting, uh, giving criminals a fair shot, but it defines us as a society. And then in 2000, we started to swing back, and I would say in, the, in 2010, the decade that started with 2010 and is ending now, we became fully um, aware that our job as a court was to protect people's rights from acts of the state that were unconstitutional. And it was not judicial activism to enforce those rights rigorously, and it was not trespass to do what the legislature had asked us to do, and we suddenly figured out that the reason people were using words like activism and politicization was because they didn't like the result. And it's a lot easier to presumptively dismiss a result by throwing a label at it than analyzing it. So the suggestion that judges should not make law is so foreign to somebody who grew up in a common law system. Common law is all judge-made law. We didn't start hearing the debate about interpreting, only interpreting law, not making law, until we were getting this American stuff. And when you interpret law, sometimes you make it. The person's case, 1929, the Supreme Court of Canada said the word persons in the BNA Act does not include women and so they can't be appointed to the Senate. Lord Sankey in 1929 at the Privy Council said, of course the word persons can include women. S Supreme Court of Canada had taken an originalist approach Lord Sankey in England said, it's a constitution. A constitution is a living tree. It's got to grow with the times, and it needs a large and liberal interpretation. And that is the approach we have had to the interpretation of rights and freedoms since 1929. To suddenly say, it's not a living tree. The word equality means the same thing as it did when it was first enacted, the way the Americans do, so that rights don't fit into the square peg of 200 years ago, to me is an anemic and sclerotic approach to something that should be a living, breathing document to stay in touch with the time. So gay rights became part of equality. Um, abortion laws were struck down uh, because they did not protect the right to life security of the person of women and their equality. We made that constitution say things. Now, were they controversial? To some people, but I have to tell you, in a, as you know, in 100% of the cases, 50% of the people think we're wrong because people win and sometimes people lose, and the ones who lose always think we got it wrong. So the reason you have judges who do not have to go to the polls, who have independence until they're 75, who are supposed to be impartial and do what they think is the right thing, is because there's got to be an institution in our democratic checks and balances that doesn't worry about what the majority thinks. You should be aware of it if you know what that majority is, and I've never understood what public opinion means anyway. But you have to have a place where people who are not the majority, minority interests, can be protected by their courts. So I don't, if I were a politician and I had to go to the polls in four years, I don't know what I would decide about the hot button political issues. But as a judge, I have no role at all in worrying about whether or not what I'm going to decide or what you're going to decide, you felt the same way, is going to be controversial. We have to do what we think is right. So this discussion now that's going on is new-ish. Um, it's getting traction because it has resonance with a lot of people in the United States. 
but I have to tell you it's been 50 years since I've looked to the United States for judicial leadership. And the rest of the world, the rest of the democratic world, England, European Court of Human Rights, Israel, South, South Africa, all of those courts look to us to, to continue to fight for rights. We become the judicial leaders because of that living tree approach. And I will resist with every fiber for the last two years that I'm a judge any attempt to scale us back to being people who just look at what the word means instead of what it means to people. Otherwise, I have no thoughts about the subject. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I want to get back to your family. I want to get back to itch. Uh, you, you sort of ran over that rather quickly, uh, chasing him after three years. Uh, the reason I want to get back to the family is that I don't know of any other couple that have been mm, so mutually supportive of one another so loving to, to one another. You I don't say mean, that? I know, Wait a minute. I know. You and Nancy? I, I know that's going to, bear with me, bear sure. with me. Uh, then uh, you and it. And you, each of you has excelled in your own different fields. And then you have two wonderful sons, two remarkable sons that come along, nourished by the love of their parents and support of their parents to be successful in their own right. So what, what is the Abella recipe for all of that? My recipe is chutzpah. His recipe is patience. <laughs> Can I tell you the story? It's pretty, when I tell people today in the feminist world my story, he's, he hates when I tell this story. So I met him. The international teach-ins took place in Toronto in 1967. That was the first one. And I met this guy in the basement of University College who had just come back from Berkeley where he was getting his master's, and he was now getting his PhD. He was 25 years old. And he had just written an article on the free speech movement in the varsity. And Oh my God, I, I was 19. I thought he was so smart. And I came home and I said to my parents, I've met the guy I'm going to marry. <laughs> he had other ideas. And so I asked around. I couldn't find him again after I met him. And so somebody said, oh, he's, he's getting his PhD. The PhD students study in the stacks in Sigmund Samuel Library. So I went down to the stacks to look for his name. Couldn't find it. I bumped into him three months later, and I said, I looked for you in the stacks. Where's your Carol? He said, 2B. Oh, really? OK. Next time he went to 2B, I was in the Carol behind him. <laughs> and I stayed in the Carol behind him for two years. I remember at the end of the first year, every time he got up, I said, are we having coffee? He said, no. <laughs> Can you give me a lift home? No. And then I said, what are you doing this summer? He said, I'm going to Europe. I said, what a coincidence. <laughs> I said to my parents, I think I'll go to Europe this summer. He said, fine. Are you going with anybody? No, just thought I would go. He said, I'll leave a message for you at the American Express. He was going with his best friend. I said, oh, great, in Paris. Wonderful, thank you. Six days I went to the American Express in Paris. <laughs> Nothing from Irving Abella. So I hitchhiked around Europe. It was, you could do that in those days, 19 years old. I bumped into him by accident at the bus station in Tel Aviv with his boyfriend. I said, where have you been? You told me you'd leave a message for me at American Express. He said, you didn't get it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, so where are you going next? He said, London. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> and, and I saw him in London, and I borrowed $50 from him so he'd have to see me again <laughs> in Toronto. And then I, here we are 50 years later. So, you know, how do you know a marriage or a relationship is going to work out? I just thought he was so smart and so appealing and so delicious. And he eventually, I think, after 20 years, came to see me, not in dissimilar terms, but it took a long time. <laughs> and 
I didn't know what it was going to be like to marry um, a professor. He didn't know what it was going to be like to marry somebody who wanted to be a lawyer. Neither of us knew what it was going to be like to have kids because I didn't know any women who practiced law who had kids. We were on an experiment. So we did it the way we thought it would work for us. His whole salary went to paying a housekeeper. Um, we were equal at home. Neither of us cooked or cleaned. <laughs> but we both, we both spent time with the kids. And he was there every day when they came home from school. The kids say they have two mothers. One has a beard. <laughs> when you're raising kids, you know, I, I was a family court judge pregnant with Zach with our second one. I had a three-year-old at home. Can I tell you the story about JJ? So I'm home on maternity leave from being a judge. JJ was at the swearing-in. I'm the only woman on the family court, 1976. And I read him a book called If I Were a Bus Driver. And when a book was, and his brother's upstairs in, in the crib. And when I finished, he said, this is great. I want to be a bus driver when I grow up. And I said, Jewish mother, don't you want to be a judge? Three. He looked at me and he said, only girls are judges. <laughs> um, so these kids, uh, because we did not know how it was going to turn out, and I don't speak of them publicly or itchy, and I never gave interviews because I'm Jewish and superstitious. The, the expression is an ahora. I didn't want to tempt fate. And I didn't know how it would turn out. And I used to say to journalists, I'll give you an interview if when I'm 75, my husband still likes me and I have nice kids, maybe. So I'm starting to give interviews because he doesn't dislike me. <laughs> and the kids are nice people. But I would say it was because both of us never stopped for a minute presuming anything about the kids, about each other. and. And I would say this is the secret to, to life. Just do your best and keep your fingers crossed and hope. We were just, we were just lucky. I had no idea that he would be Thank so you. wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Can you take me home because he's not going to? <laughs> But let me take that. Now, Tony's here. My sister is here. The unsung hero in the story of my father, who is a lawyer, because it was his professional path that I wanted to follow, is Fanny, my mother. Charlie Pactor is here, and he knows her. Probably the most resilient, uh, wise, intuitive, protective, generously protective person in the world. And having Fanny in our lives meant that you always had, you always knew somebody had your back. I could talk to her about anything, about anyone. She was like a Geiger counter. Mm, be careful of that one, because that, I love everybody. And she would kind of be, be just watch out, be careful. Um, I don't talk about her publicly as much as I should, but she, he died in 1970, just before I finished law school, and she died in 2010. So she lived 40 years without him. And those 40 years carried me, Itchy, and the boys. She was there for us every, every minute. And my strength, our family strength, comes in large part because of hers. Wonderful. You've talked about family, but you also have friends. I mean, the love that's in this room uh, for you, the affection that you have with your friends. And you have this unbelievable ability to, to make your friends feel that you have time for them, and you make time for them continuously. And it's quite remarkable. That, that Harry Arthurs, I think, once said that, you know, there are 2,000 close friends of Rosie Abella, but I'm a, I'm a closest friend. Um, after my mother, wife, and daughter, the only woman who's kissed me more is Rosie Abella. <laughs> 
And I think there are thousands in that category who have been hugged, kissed, embraced by Rosie. You, you love people. I do. You love people. And you presume people are good, people are worthy, people are valuable as a friend. Forgetting about what they can give, but friendship means so much. Where does that come from? Same place it comes from in you. I think um, outside of family, friends are the greatest source of happiness in life. The, the giving that you, Marie Deschamps, who was my colleague, once gave me a picture of a, of a character in Quebec who has a hose and hearts are coming out. And the expression is, uh, if you give love, you'll receive it. And I'm somebody who has just marveled at the friends. I mean, look at this room that Itchy and I have been lucky to have over the years. The, the, it's friendship. It is real friendship. It's not anything less or more. I don't even know how to describe it, but it is, it is the magic that makes you feel the world is safe and that you are safe and that the world is going to be okay because there are people like this in it. And I guess I'd, I learned at home. I remember the first time I went to the labor board, somebody said, why do you kiss everybody? And I said, because in my house, growing up, if somebody walked in the door and you didn't kiss them, it was rude. So I grew up thinking that's the way you greet people. And then I realized it's assault. You can't do that <laughs> to everybody. But it was too late, because that's who I am. But you were an eager recipient, because you gave back. <laughs> Yakabella, right? <laughs> we're the kissing lawyers. Rosie, I could go on all, all, all evening. Uh, uh, and I don't know whether this is the time to bring it. I, I don't want to bring it to a close, but I think we should. But I, before doing so, at least, let me just say, you have brought so much honor and recognition to yourself and your family. But also, with all the honors you've received, uh, you have brought great recognition and honor to this university, to the University of Toronto. And in doing so, you have really shown what it is uh, to be a, a, a real a real humanitarian, uh, a, a person that uh, thinks with her brain and with her heart. Uh, and that is a, uh, a performance that is un, unmatched, oh, unmatched in most and, and as an exemplar uh, of, of humanity. Uh, you uh, deserve the, this award just on that alone let alone your many accomplishments. Thank you, Frank. Bless you always. Thank you. Thank you.